Um, we better get going because we only have two hours and I, I've got to do uh, orientation and first chapter. Uh, so uh, my name is David Bly and I usually wear a name tag, but I've misplaced it. I don't know where it is. So I have to keep reminding myself who I am. Let's see um, what I want to do next. Let's take a look at the uh, the syllabus for Chem 203. And uh, did everybody get my email this morning with the syllabus attached? I hope you did. Check your email if you need a recent copy. I, I found some things in there that I, I thought I could clarify, so I, I edited it and then sent everybody a copy so you wouldn't have to dig for it in Blackboard. So we'll look at the syllabus first. And um, let's see, I need to share screen. And there's the syllabus. Okay. There. Can everybody see the syllabus? If you can't, uh, speak up. Um, the other thing that I want you to do is, um, if this is your first time using Zoom, then you'll need to uh, set up your Zoom so it will split screen or side by side. And I've got an appendix down here that, that gives you instructions on side by side. Uh, let's see, where is the meat of it? Okay, you go into your view options. And you should have side by side as a selection. And when your side by side comes up, the screens may be uh, odd shape. So it's probably best if you try to make one 50% of the screen and make me the other 50%. And that's not because I'm uh, narcissistic, that's because I use my whiteboard. And if if my image and screen are not big enough, then you can't see what I'm doing. I've tried the whiteboard in Zoom, uh, but it's really clunky and you have to keep flipping back and forth and it, it's just a mess. So I, I just use the whiteboard uh, behind me and it seems to go quicker. Okay, so here's the syllabus and these first uh, two pages, let me make that a little bit bigger. I think I've still got a little bit of room that we can benefit from larger type. Let's boost it up maybe to 130%. Yeah, that's a little better. <clears throat> These first two pages are uh, in a format that management the administration likes to see in all of their courses. It's kind of like a, the opening statement with basic information for the course. So you get the name of the course, how many credit hours, this catalog description, and that catalog description is, um, you can't change it unless you go through the, uh, a special process. So that's going to be, uh, standard, and you'll see that in the catalog. Prerequisites as well. The textbook, of course, there's your textbook, um, and there's the lab manual. I'll talk about that later. I'm just pointing these things out as we go. Um, let's see. The rest of it, um, I duplicate a little bit of this stuff in the rest of the syllabus. When you get down to page three, that's when the, the appearance changes because this is where uh, I have the option of setting it up the way I want. Those first two pages are mandated. Okay, so on the left-hand side in this blue box is my contact information. Um, you can call, this is my office at New River. Of course, I won't be there, <clears throat> but if you leave a voice message, the system converts the voice message into, a, into a, uh, an audio file and emails it to me. So I get it pretty quick. 
Um, if you need quicker response, there's my cell phone. Um, getting me on the voice for my cell phone is, is difficult because I get so many junk calls. I usually wait and look for the caller ID, and if I don't recognize the number, then I just let you leave a message. But if you text me at that number, you're more likely to get a quick response. So the first time you text me on my cell phone, identify yourself by name and the course you're in. Uh, just that one time, the first time you do it. And then every time you do it after that, the, um, the app, um, what do they call it? Puts, puts all your messages in a string. So all I have to do is just scroll up to the top and I see who it is. So that's why you only need to do it once. <clears throat> why would you need to a quick response from me? Say you're in the middle of an exam and your power goes out or you lose your internet connection. Then I need to go in and reset it. And you don't want to sit around for hours uh, waiting for me to do that. So if you text me and I'm not behind the wheel somewhere, of course, um, and I have access to my computer or a computer, then I can log in and I can reset the exam. You can, uh, you have to start it over, unfortunately, when I reset it. Uh, but we'll talk about that also, what you do in those cases. Um, uh, that's my office on New River, but <laughs> there's nobody there. Um, now, for if you need to Zoom interact with me, these are my office hours that I've set up to Zoom. And there's the ID that I use for Zoom. That's my personal ID or, or whatever they call it, private or personal. <clears throat> and you can zoom into these times and I'll already be there because it's office hours. Now, how do, how do you use that ID? Well, I've got an, in the appendix or in the body of the syllabus, I'll show you how to do that. So I'll cover that in just a minute. Okay, we got the text covered. Um, the, the only reason that I have you buy the lab manual is because I use some of those exercises <clears throat> and I don't want copyright infringement. I take those exercises out and modify them because they're a bit clunky sometimes and not easy to understand. So I modify them, but I don't want any uh, blowback for a copyright infringement. So I have you buy the manual. So if you just don't touch the manual, if it's shrink wrapped, leave it there. If it's not, don't go into it and mark it up unless you want to keep it, of course, that's fine. <clears throat> and then you may be able to resell it. But all of the, the lab exercises are in Blackboard, modified the way I want them. Okay, and when we, I'm going to give you a tour of Blackboard um, and I'll show you where all that stuff is. Um, you're going to need a calculator, right? And you need one that's scientific and has all these functions in it. Um, conveniently, if you buy a calculator that says scientific on the package, it'll have everything that you need. Um, but you do need to go in and learn how to use it. If you're using a, cal a new calculator, you're unfamiliar with it, learn how to, to enter numbers, how to do operations, standard operations. You'll need to learn how to input scientific notation. And we'll have to talk about that too. What is scientific notation? Um, you need to know how to do roots. Usually square roots is enough, but occasionally you might need a cube root. Uh, powers, how do you do powers of a number? How do you do the log of a number? And more importantly, how do you do the anti-log? The anti-log on most calculators is the key that has 10 to the X. This is the common logarithm, base 10. So if you think back to your math course and when you were studying logs, um, you know that the definition of a log is um, like this. When we say y equals the log of x, what we're actually saying is 
<clears throat> y is the power of 10 that equals x. So we could rearrange that and it would be uh, 10 to the y equals x. So this is the antilog of that. So if you have that number and you need to take the antilog, you do the power of 10 of that number. Okay. Um, that won't mean a lot right now, but we will get to it and I'll cover it in detail. Um, the ln is the natural log and its antilog is e to the x. So just locate those keys. Um, most of them come with user manuals to tell you how to use them. Maybe even give you an example problem. So you may want to run through that. Get familiar with it <clears throat> because we're not going to spend any time learning how to do, learning how to uh, operate your calculator. There are too many flavors. You buy one from Texas Instrument, they do a certain way. You buy one from um, Hewlett Packard, they do a different way. If you buy one like mine, like this, it's a reverse Polish notation. <laughs> uh, it takes some getting used to, but once you figure it out, uh, you can do things a whole lot faster with this design. But it's not common. Most of them are algebraic, like one plus one equals. And that's, you punch those keys and that's what you get. Um, I won't go into that detail because um, unless you're looking for them, you won't find one like that. Okay. Um, every lecture and every view, review session that we do is recorded. That's the nice thing about Zoom or any of these uh, uh, video conferencing applications. They record the, uh, the whole session for you. And then I take the files that are generated from that recording and I manipulate them a little bit and process them. And then I post them in Blackboard. So you can go in and say you want to review the recording because you might have missed something. Uh, typically um, in a class, especially one that's two hours long, you're going to miss half the stuff that goes on. That's just, that's just the way the brain works. So going back and reviewing can, can be a useful tool. Uh, and I post those videos. I also post ancient videos, ones that I've done way in the past. If you want to see, you know, how things have changed or if I explain it differently in the past and I identify those in Blackboard as previous semester in red so that you don't waste your time on uh, viewing an old one if you don't want to. Um, so obviously for those of you who are here, you must have an internet connection. Uh, I don't know how reliable it is, depends on where you are, where you're located, and who's your service provider. Um, you need a PC, a tablet, or a laptop. And um, uh, Chromebooks are not very friendly with any of the applications we're going to use. They, they don't like Blackboard. The reason that Chromebooks are a problem is they don't have any of their own internal storage. So they work strictly. They just have enough memory inside to get them connected to the Internet. And then everything they do is on the Internet. That's why they're so cheap, because they've got virtually nothing inside. <clears throat> but that's a problem because sometimes you need to download things and process them uh, native on the computer uh, to make the application work. And that's why Chromebook, I, I frown on Chromebooks. Um, you need a web camera and a microphone. Obviously you've got one or you wouldn't be here. Okay. So let's see, I tend to be long winded. So, I'll tell you right now, <clears throat> if, if we're in the middle of a session, a lecture or a review session or something that is being recorded and I run out of time, then you may have other obligations. You may have to be somewhere like pick up your kids from school or, or you may have to be to work, right? So once the class time period is over, you can go. And what I'll do is for those who want to want to and can stay fine. 
I'll just keep talking and I'll finish the recording of the material that I intend to cover that day. Then if you have to leave, you can come back and look at the rest of the recording and you haven't missed anything except the ability to ask your questions in person. <clears throat> but at least you'll get all the materials. Okay. So <clears throat> how are you evaluated? Basically in two forms, um, exams and uh, laboratory reports. Those are the, the, the meat of your evaluations. The exams are given in Blackboard, and I'll show you where that is, but you have to access the exams through Lockdown Browser. <clears throat> That's a, a monitoring program. I don't, you may have used it with some other courses. It's fairly new for Southern. We've been using it at uh, New River for several years. And it's, brand, it's virtually brand new for Southern, so some of your instructors may not be using it yet. <clears throat> <clears throat> but I'll show you uh, where to go in the appendix. Uh, it's referenced here, appendix three, how to download the lockdown browser. You have to get it from a specific web link that's keyed to Southern. If you don't go to that link, you won't get the lockdown browser that you can load and do Southern materials. It just lock you out. I mean, you won't be able to use it. Uh, the reason that for that is because Lockdown Browser is a licensed program. So if you have to go to that specific location to get the version that allows you to do Southern work. Okay, uh, we'll look at that later, but that's just to let you know that all of the exams are proctored using Lockdown Browser and Respondus Monitor. So in order to take it, you have to open the lockdown browser and then go to blackboard from within the browser <clears throat> because the browser shuts you out of, of everything that could possibly allow you to cheat. Um, and most students are, are really honest people. You know, I, I rarely do I suspect cheating and it's always a, a letdown when I, when I find it, but most of my students are just as honest as the day is long, and that's wonderful. <clears throat> but um, there are always some rotten apples laying around, and they're going to mess things up for everybody else. So that's why we have to do proctoring. Um, there's no final exam in this class. There's just no time to get to a final exam. So the, the four regular exams uh, constitute... Excuse me. They junk calls. The four exams uh, are average to 69% of your grade. So I would take uh, your, your score for exam one, two, three, four, and average them, and then multiply them by 0.69. And that's the, the portion of your grade due to exams. Do the same thing for lab reports. Take all your lab reports, average them together, and take 0.3 of those. Add them together. And then there's a syllabus test that is basically a giveaway. I mean, you, you can have the syllabus right there in front of you while you're taking the test, and it's worth 1% of your grade. That's an easy 1%. All you have to do is read the syllabus and answer the questions. <clears throat> Um, okay, so I think the uh, syllabus test is not proctored. Once we get to Blackboard, I'll confirm that. I think the exams are proctored with Lockdown Browser. Uh, syllabus test is not. Okay, so here's the schedule. And if you find yourself uh, away from a computer, like one of, my, one of the students here today is on an iPhone, right? So in order to do the iPhone, um, I don't know, maybe you can get to Blackboard and use the link, the Zoom link that's in Blackboard. But if you find yourself unable to connect that way, this is your ID right here. I put it in several places. 
<clears throat> and all you have to do is open the Zoom client. So you do have to download and, and install the Zoom client in your phone or whatever device. And then when you call it up, it'll ask you for the ID and there it is. And you can connect from anywhere you're located with any device. Um, okay, so here's what I plan for us to be doing each day. Right, we're doing this one right now, the class business and discussion of the syllabus and expectations. And then um, hopefully I can finish this within the next 30 minutes and we can get to the first chapter, basic concepts of chemistry. Now, when this says safety practices in the chemistry lab is the first item, that's when you start it. When the, the, you submit it, when it's due, is right here in red. And that's one of the edits I made because it wasn't on there before and it wasn't clear when these things were due. It looks like they're due on these days, but they're not. They're due on the day that the following lab is due. So I just put these things in red and that clarifies uh, when lab one is due, it's due on the, the lab two day, lab two is due on the lab three day, so forth and so on. Um, in yellow, I've highlighted the exams just to make them obvious and the chapters that will be covered. Okay. And these are the the sections, chapter and sections that are covered for each one of the uh, lectures. And notice that we have three chapters due for exam one. <clears throat> the way I've set it up is um, we usually take one chapter for each class session and then the, the day, actually the week <laughs> before the exam, we have a review session to clear up any problems, work. Uh, when we go into the review session, first thing I do is ask anybody if you're having specific problems, because I want to be sure and cover those first. And then after everybody's uh, aired their problems and we've dealt with them, then if there's any time left, I'll go in and pull up some major concepts and problems related to them and work those for you and, and get some interaction there. Uh, hopefully preparing you for exam one. Now notice that the, the exam one is due on this date. That's when you would take it, uh, February 19th. But it's uh, on the web using lockdown browser going into Blackboard. So we're not going to take up, take up any class time <clears throat> doing exams like we would if we were face to face. So instead, on that day that your exam due, we kick off on the next section. So on that day, we'll jump into chapter four. Um, I've identified some other important dates, like uh, this Monday is when mid-semester grades are due. So that means that everything above it is part of that grade. Right, all your lab reports that it were due. Um, there's only one exam that we've covered in that amount of time. So that's all that goes into that average. Uh, let's see, here's the last day that you can withdraw with a W rather than a, an A through F letter grade. And the final grades are due on May 17th. Okay. And if, if something, you know, just pops into your mind, you have a question, stop me. Anytime, lecture, review, whenever I'm talking, just jump in there and uh, and ask your question. Now, let me do a, a rapid check here. Okay, we haven't, we haven't got anybody new yet. Okay. So what's this homework about? Well, I don't grade homework. I just don't have the time to do it. Um, if I had access to a homework service, like I do on the New River campus, uh, all the homework I give here is, is, uh, is provided by Cengage, the publisher. 
and they have homework applications that my students do and they're graded by the system and, and that's good. It gives you practice, you get homework. This homework, I don't have time to grade, but if you work all the problems that are numbered here at the back of your each chapter, then you should have absolutely no trouble on the exam. Um, I know that's a lot of problems, but uh, one thing about chemistry and sciences actually in general, your two best friends studying chemistry are curiosity, right? Why does something happen? Always asking when you see a, uh, a con new concept or a problem, why is it, why does that happen? I mean, what's special about it? Curiosity will take you a long way. Your other best friend is boredom. When you start working a problem, if you're bored working those problems, then you know you've worked plenty of them. It looks, it doesn't look new. It, it doesn't uh, excite your interest anymore. <laughs> you just, <laughs> you see that problem and you know how to work it. Boredom is your friend. Okay, so, and the, uh, the answers to these uh, questions are in the back of your text also. And notice I chose, I think I chose all odd numbers. Yeah, that's because most textbooks, they either give you the answers to odd question numbers or even question numbers, but not both. So I picked the ones where the answers were in the book. And what you would do is work those problems and if they're giving you trouble, contact me either before or during the review session and we'll tackle them. And hopefully the light bulb will go on. Okay. Um, there's a reminder for uh, withdraw with a W. Uh, let's see. You're expected to attend every class session. It's to your advantage to attend, but I only take attendance to satisfy management. They want to know if you're in class and it's probably because of uh, uh, government mandates. In other words, they don't get the money from the government unless they can prove their students are in class. So I take attendance. But uh, in this class, you don't get any special credit for just showing up. Bonus or extra credit? Okay. I do have, uh, for exam one, I have one extra credit project, and I'll show that to you when we get in Blackboard. Exam two, I have another extra credit project um, that can help boost your grade. I'll show you where those are. Um, I, there may also be some bonus questions in the exams. I believe there are. They will be clearly identified. So those, whenever you see an extra credit question, you can tackle it if you want to. If you don't, it's not going to hurt your grade. Or if you do, it's not going to hurt your grade either. Makeup testing is, testing is really a moot point. It's irrelevant because you do the test at your own leisure, you know, on the web. So makeup is, is really no, no big deal. Uh, exam etiquette, of course. Now, when you're taking exams, uh, I will say this. Um, you can only bring, you can bring your uh, calculator, of course, but within the browser, I've set it up so that you have access to a scientific calculator in the browser, right? So if you, if you're, batteries go dead, your calculator won't work, you still have that calculator available. Um, just like when you're, when you're on camera, anytime you're on camera, you want to be dressed, right? Um, when you take your exams, the uh, system will be looking at your face and doing facial recognition. So you don't want any bright backgrounds to where your face is dark you want the dark background and light face. Uh, and you should be able to see yourself in a, in a little uh, inset. So you can tell if you're light or dark. Uh, 
And where was that? Oh, um, I've had students that uh, try to take their exams laying down in bed in their pajamas. And that's definitely a uh, bad style. In fact, it's difficult for the system to prove that you're there if you're doing that. Um, I mentioned earlier that if you had a internet interruption or a power failure, that I could reset the exam. Um, since, I, since resetting clears all your answers, um, it's a good idea if you, if you find some way to record your answers as you go. Um, the, the questions are randomized every time the test restarts. So just typing the number, putting the number and the answer together isn't 100% reliable. Unless, of course, since they're all multiple choice questions, um, you have a list of answers and no two answers are going to be the same, obviously. So if you come to a question and you have four choices, then you can look down and see, find the one that fits in those choices. That's possible. Oh, but I also, in the lockdown browser, I have enabled the ability to print the screen. So if you want to, when you get, get ready to leave a screen, you can screenshot print it and keep that uh, just in case your power goes out. Okay, uh, these are my office hours. Oh, good, and this is the way you get to me. In, in order to uh, download the uh, Zoom client, you go to this website, and I think there are several options there. You can download for a Windows-based computer for an Apple-based computer or the, um, I think I got the Zoom client on my phone by going to the App Store. I didn't put that in here, but you guys are probably more tech savvy than I am anyway. Uh, okay, so that's how you connect uh, if you're not on your computer and you can't get the Blackboard. Uh, this stuff is mandated to, I stuck it in there because that's what the school says you have to do. And then we get to the appendices, right? So this describes how you attend a, a Zoom meeting. And you obviously are, uh, have been successful at that. Appendix two is the side by side. We looked at that earlier. Appendix three should be lockdown browser. Okay, here we go. Respondus monitor lockdown browser is the uh, proctoring service that the school has purchased. And uh, you get steps here in how to load it up, how to get it on your computer. Uh, here we go. Here's the address right there. In order to load the respondents lockdown, you have to go to that address only. Um, and gives you installation instructions. Uh, it, depending on what kind of computer you have, if you have an iPad, this gives you instructions on loading in your iPad. Uh, let's see. There's a lot of detail in here, I know, it's, it's, but I don't want any slip ups, any mistakes. Um, each time you go in, there's going to be a security check, right? So you'll have to show it an ID, you'll have to go through various steps before you can even start the exam. So I'll show you in Blackboard in a few minutes. There's a, a practice test that you uh, use from within respond to lockdown to check your uh, technology, all, all your equipment and your procedures so that you don't waste any time when you start an actual exam because the exams are timed. So that practice exam um, lets you know if there are any errors that need to be corrected before you waste any time taking an exam and it's not working. <clears throat> Okay, here's your practice test, and the, well, there's the practice test, and anytime you take an exam, the practice test doesn't have a password, 
So you can go right into that one. But all the exams have a password. And I just made it really simple. I'd rather not use a password, but I've had problems in the past if you don't have a password. So I just give it the CRN for the course, right? So the course is, is uh, CH203, and in parentheses is the course reference number, which is 509. So you just type in 509, and that's your password. Okay. So I'll let you try that. Be sure that you get set up for that before the exam occurs. And if you have any problems, then I'll, I'll do everything I can to help you resolve them or get you in touch with someone who can. Okay, so any questions on the syllabus? And we'll go into Blackboard now and uh, look at that as quickly as possible because <laughs> I've got to get in uh, uh, the first chapter. So let's stop the share. Here we go. And it's a good idea. There's only one student that I see video. So if you have a if you have a valid reason for not video, say you're you're at work, or something like that. But I, I need to at least see you once. Actually, I need to see you fairly often to prove you're there. Excellent, excellent. All right. Very good. Okay, um, we still got a few just to prove that you're there. I suspect I've had students in the past, they show up for a few minutes and then they, they turn off their video and then go, <laughs> I don't know, play basketball or something. <clears throat> or play video games. Okay, so uh, let's see. So I now wanna share my, let's see, where am I in the course? Uh, scroll down. Come on. I think this is it. Share this. Yeah, this is it. Um, this is where I come up with Southern, uh, the, this is not the, the Southern landing page. I call this one up because it's got uh, email in it. But you can still get to the course by way of uh, uh, going to online class. And this is probably old news to most of you. We call up the class. Um, as an instructor, there's going to be a lot of junk in here. It won't be this busy for you. 203 Spring 21, right there. Calls up the course. Let's see. I've already got it called up. Well, let's close that one. Go to this one. Okay, so this is what you'll see when you first start up. And there are two important links over here, actually three important links on the side. This uh, start here syllabus gives you, and this is the instructor's view. So maybe what I should do is go to uh, uh, student preview. There, this is what you will see. Okay, so start here syllabus. Um, there's a course tour, right, a video. So I've gone through and done what I'm going to do now in a video. Uh, so this will be extra stuff. This links you to the learning modules, right? And there's a direct connection over here on the left, right there, learning modules. And then below it, the Zoom connection. So you already know where that is or you wouldn't be here. But other things that are in, in this particular uh, page are the syllabus right here. So if you click this, you get uh, a syllabus that you can scroll through right there. But there's also one that you can download right up here. If you click on that in a separate window, it, that comes up. Now, what do you do with that? Well, I find that browsers don't print very well. Um, so what I do is I take this and I download it. Let's see, where's, does it not have a download function? Well, that's strange. What's this? Fit to page? Rotate? Okay, that's not going to let you download. Let me try something else. 
let's do right click. Everybody knows about right click. Save link as. There you go. If you do that, then you can save yourself a copy uh, anywhere on your computer. Okay. I knew there was a way around that. Okay, so if we go back and see what else is here, um, all of the labs and a bunch of other material I distribute as PDF files. So you're going to need a way to read them. If you don't already have a PDF reader, you can go to one of these locations. Adobe Acrobat uh, has a free reader. With any of these free installations, you got to be real careful that they don't install some um, ghost applications in the background. They're, by law, they have to offer them to you. But usually, they're, uh, when they offer them to you during the installation, those ghost applications are automatically checked to be installed, so you have to uncheck them. So that's the one from Adobe Acrobat. And then I found this one is a pretty good one, too, from Foxbit. So you can use either one. Uh, so, and these, you know about the breadcrumbs here at the top, so you can go backwards, just follow the breadcrumbs back out of the woods and you're where you want to be. Um, this free Microsoft Office 365, uh, it's really a basic stripped down version of Office. Um, and the reason I found, I know that is because I have this lab that I, that my uh, students, I used to have my students do at New River, showing them how to use Microsoft Excel to process scientific data, right? Because it's a useful tool. It can, it can speed up the process and generate nice tables and graphs and things. But this free Microsoft Office 365 uh, has stripped out some of the functionality of Excel, I'm sure of. So I tell you, um, if you have no other option, go ahead and use it. But you're better off finding a, a full version of Microsoft Office if you can afford it. And if, and usually most vendors have a pricing structure that will give you a student or instructor price, which is considerably less than the uh, uh, free market, the open market price. Um, let's see. Uh, that's all the stuff that I put in there. The rest of this is, is mandated by the school. Now, so we can either go to the learning modules from here, or we can go over here. And there you have reproduced a bunch of stuff. In fact, I put the PDF readers uh, box in here also, so you don't have to go back and forth the other one. And here's your, your homework outline. Uh, let's see. There should be. Am I missing? Uh, so you would have to go into the syllabus to see the, uh, excuse me, syllabus here. You would have to go into the syllabus and scroll down. I usually, I think what I'll do is um, after the, after we finish here, I'm going to take this schedule and I'm going to put it over here in learning modules, just like this um, table. There'll be another table with the schedule, so you won't have to go looking for it. I usually do that. I don't know why I missed it on this one. Okay, so you got the, the homework schedule there. Um, here's your syllabus knowledge test that's worth 1%. Um, let's see. Is everybody seeing this? It says I'm shared, but I, sometimes I wonder. I suppose. I uh, don't hear any objection, so I assume it's still being shared. That looks pretty good. Okay. <laughs> uh, let me see. Now i got to go back and find my share again. Uh, here it is. Okay. <clears throat> so
So there's your syllabus uh, knowledge check, and you don't need Lockdown Browser. So you can do that one right away. If you want to do that before you install the Lockdown Browser, that's fine. Um, and you, this is the way it's going to look, whether you're in Lockdown Browser or not. It looks just like this. If you've already, if you've ever taken uh, a Blackboard native Blackboard exam, uh, they all look the same. And it gives you how much time. I just stuck in 30 minutes here. Uh, it's not going to take you that long. And besides, any of the tests that I give you in, in Blackboard, um, they have a, a time limit uh, that is um, part of the test. But if you exceed the time limit, it doesn't automatically shut you out and submit your exam. All right. That time limit is just there to let me know that you're taking longer than I allowed. And that helps me uh, adjust the time for future classes. Um, the one thing that you will notice is if you finish and submit before the time's up, then the system will grade it and put the, the grade in your grade book automatically. But if you exceed the time, then the instructor, me, I have to go in and look at the test and accept it before the grade will show up. That's the only major difference I've noticed. Uh, so I'm not going to take this one. That's one. Um, one thing about it is the syllabus test uh, is you have to do that one first before you can do the exam. Notice, uh, let's see, wait a minute. Let me see if I, did I make a mistake? No, okay, I'm right. Okay, inside this folder that says exam one, notice there are all the materials you need, but there's no exam, right? That exam won't show up until you complete the syllabus test. Okay, and similarly, if we go back to exam two, there's no exam. The exam for two won't show up until you've submitted and gotten a grade for exam one. So that's just so that you take the exams in sequence. And you don't, say you get behind and you say, uh-oh, exam two is coming up on a deadline, but I haven't even done exam one yet. So I'm gonna do exam two and go back and do exam one later. Can't do it that way. You got to do them in order. Okay, so let's go back to um, exam one module and just I'll show you what's there. Okay, besides the exam being absent, here are all those uh, videos that I produced for uh, previous semesters. All right, so you can look at those if you want. Um, after we complete. Um, this lecture, I'll take that exam, that um, video, and I'll post it in here and identify it as exam one, chapter one, and so forth and so on, and the date. Uh, but it won't have previous semester on it, so you can pick it out pretty easily if you want to go back and, and uh, view it. Um, also, this PowerPoints folder has all the PowerPoints. For that exam, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. Notice each one is has three different flavors. This is the the PowerPoint slides. And if you have Microsoft uh, PowerPoint, you can view those, download them, and view them just like their PowerPoints, just like the ones I show you in class. If you're away and you don't have access to your computer uh, that has Microsoft Office then you can look at the PDF version. The only thing wrong with the PDF is any animations, any embedded videos won't be there. Uh, HTML5 is one I like. I take the PowerPoints and I convert them into um, a browser language. That's what HTML is. And you can click on that and the slideshow comes up inside your browser. So you don't even need PowerPoint to look at them. And you can scroll through them and see everything that we're gonna to see today. Okay, 
I've used those before in class. When PowerPoint was glitchy or my PowerPoint slide set wasn't working right, I just go into, into the Blackboard course and call up this and continue with the lecture. Okay, so those are there in the PowerPoint. Uh, let's see, what else do I have for you? Uh, let's see. Okay, this is important for the very beginning because in chemistry, you've got to learn the alphabet. And the alphabet in chemistry is names of elements. They're symbols, right? So that's what this one is for. This one shows you the symbols that I want you to memorize. It looks like a lot, but really it's only about half of the ones that are in the periodic table. If they're in this red box with kind of a pink background like that, those are the ones I want you to focus on and memorize. Okay. You only have two way down here at the bottom, uranium and plutonium, and they're there for historical significance. Uh, the uranium little boy bomb destroyed Hiroshima, the end of World War II, and Fat Man was made out of plutonium that destroyed Nagasaki. That's the only reason those two are there. Uh, so, how do you memorize those symbols? Well, um, there's a program. You can search the internet. You can find um, uh, a program on the web that will allow you to flashcard your way through like that. Or you can buy a set of flashcards. I've had students do that. Uh, I like the one I like is get yourself some blank index cards and make your own flashcards. Symbol on one side, name on the other. The reason that's, that's good is it's repetition. By putting the symbol and writing the name yourself, that's your first step to memorizing those symbols. Then once you get the cards made, you can drill through them. You can set this stack I got right, this stack I got wrong, do the stack I got wrong until they're all in the right stack. And then go back and do it again. And then, uh, wait a day or two, do it again until you can do it three days in a row and not miss a single one. Then you know they're memorized. <clears throat> Notice the names are not there. Uh, looking up the names for these symbols, that's also a step in the memories, memory process. Uh, one other thing in this uh, particular periodic table, which I had to create from scratch, believe it or not, because I couldn't find one on the internet that would, that would suit me, that I was, that was editable. So I just created it myself. These that are in with the blue background, I know it's not going to mean much to you now, but these are diatomic elements. That is those elements in their at one atmosphere pressure and room temperature will always be written as diatomics, that is two atoms hooked together. So the significance of that is if you read a problem, a word problem that says uh, oxygen it reacts with something to produce something else, and it just says oxygen, you know that you better write O2 in the reaction equation or it'll never balance, right? So those are important, hydrogen, Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Those are all diatomic. Notice this upside down L, starting with nitrogen. Go over like that. Okay. Um, oh, um, yeah, I'm running long, I know. Extra credit I mentioned. Right here, build a periodic table. This is also meant not only to give you extra credit, but to help you um, learn things about the periodic table before we actually jump into it and I explain why everything is where it is. Um, in this case, what I've given you is, let's see, here's the, here's the document. These are the instructions and these are the points that each of these tasks is worth, okay? I know it looks like a lot of work, but 
I guess it is a lot of work. <laughs> Use uh, colored pencils, they're the best, to do all of this stuff. And here's your blank table. You're gonna fill this table in, right? So this one right over here uh, should be hydrogen. And this one over here should be helium, right? And you put it in a, a certain position and include all this information with it, right? So you've got that other periodic table. You can use that to help you position everything and get the right information in there. Uh, and color codes, right? So what do you do with it once you get it finished? That's the next logical question. Let's see, where am I? Uh, let me close that. Uh, inside this assignment is a place called attach files. So once you complete your project, you've got to convert it into something that you can uh, attach or upload to submit it. Um, there are various ways you can do that. If you have a multifunction printer, you can scan it. And that's probably, that'll probably give you the best product. But if you don't have a, a scanner, you can uh, use your iPhone or your Android and take a picture of it. Uh, you could submit the image file just like that. Uh, submit both of them, okay? Submit the instruction page and the completed periodic table. The reason for that is I use the instruction page to grade, okay? And it'll have your name on it. Periodic table will have your name on it, usually. Uh, some students submit their work and forget to put their name on it. <clears throat> anyway, um, you can do you can submit the image file or if you have an android phone you can you can load an app called cam scanner or something similar to that and when you take a picture of anything um, it allows you to convert those that picture or multiple pictures into a pdf file on your phone and then you su submit the pdf file uh, I think iPhone has one that's actually built in. It's native to the iPhone. But those are options. Uh, if you submit image files, I'm going to convert them to PDFs anyway so that I can store them on my computer and I can uh, upload them. When I grade, there's a place where I can attach the graded product so that you can see what the results of the, uh, of the graded product. And I'll do that for all your labs too. Uh, we'll talk about the labs in just a minute. Okay, so let's cancel that and look down here. What else do I have? Uh, that's it. Now there should be for exam two, there should be uh, an extra credit. Yeah, extra credit. This is name compounds. So when we get into the chapters for exam two, we're gonna learn how to name compounds. And this gives you some extra practice plus extra credit for naming compounds. It's fairly simple. The, uh, if you save this on your computer, this file right here, it says savable. I've created a PDF, which you can save in your reader. Normally when you fill out a form in your PDF reader, you can't save it, you have to print it. But I've got the, the professional version of Acrobat and one of the options is when I create a form, I can uh, also create a savable document so that you can fill out the form and save it. So that way you can fill it out and submit it that way. Okay, so let's go back. Yeah, I'm already running past. Um, you have some other helpful information down here and we'll, we'll cover these things as we go. Uh, balancing equations, I show you, give you hints on how to do that. Polyatomic ions, um, that won't mean anything to you right now, but it will. <clears throat> okay, so let me see if I can wrap this up pretty soon. Uh, laboratory exercise, okay, we didn't get to those. Um, 
this is just a caution not to try to print your anything that you uh, in your browser. Don't print from the browser. It, sometimes it just won't work and sometimes it messes up. Um, so here's your first exercise. Safety practices in the lab. And when you open that up, there's your document, right? So uh, we've discovered that what you need to do is right click and save link as then you have that document on your computer and you can complete it. So let's look at it just for a second. All right. So here's the background information. And I think this came out of your, uh, I'm not sure if it did, if it, if it came out of your uh, uh, lab workbook. Uh, so that's all background information. And you'll need to go back in there to find answers to questions too. Safety information. Okay. Um, this is going to be a, probably a little bit difficult to fill these in because we're not in the lab, right? So where's the shower? Well, if you've never been in the lab, you don't know where the shower is. So I'm going to grade this really leniently. Um, so here we go. Here's the, the lab quiz. So this is the graded part. It's really short. Uh, you just answer the questions. Now, if, if you can't figure out how to use your PDF reader to fill out the form, or if it's just not working for you, then you can print it, fill it out by hand, and submit it the way we talked about earlier. You know, take a picture or scan it or whatever it takes, just as long as you can get it to me in Blackboard. And I'll show you where that is in Blackboard in just a minute. This would be a good time, I guess. Um, so if you, well, if it won't submit, then there may be a problem that we can't fix. So in that case, I'll accept uh, email submissions. So you just attach the document to an email and send it to me at my Southern address. Um, the, the hazards with sending an email is I get hundreds of emails every day and the chances of getting lost are much greater if you do it that way. That's why submitting in Blackboard is better because it goes into my grade book automatically and I see it there and then I can grade it and you're sure to get your grade. <laughs> it's not lost in the ether. Okay. So let's go back to labs. So that's the general appearance of the labs. They will all be, uh, let's see, let's try this one. Okay, so there's the assignment and let's see, there's supposed to be Okay. Oh, there it is. Okay, there's supposed to be a demonstration for each of the labs. All right. <clears throat> so, <laughs> sorry for the voice clearing. This is actually done in your lab space that you would normally uh, be uh, working in. And I got this GoPro camera on my head, so it sees what I see. Um, and what you do is you, you have your exercise in front of you and you've already read through the exercise once. So now you have the exercise, you got the video and you pay attention and see what information is required in the hard copy. And as you go, you fill that information in and you pause it if you need to like this and you just view the video and answer the questions. So, uh, this needs to stretch over some, but it's not going to let me do it. Okay, so if you go over here like this, now you can see that this is the demo. So you should have the hard copy document and a demo with every one of these. So let me go back up and see, did I do one for safety? No, there's not one for safety. So the safety doesn't have a demo. You just read the document and fill it out. But the rest of them do have demonstrations. 
like uh, let's see, let's just go down and randomly pick a pick one further down in the semester. Like here's Boyle's law. Yep, there's the demonstration. Okay, so there's your document, there's your demonstration, and this special note. Um, let's see. Okay, I did this video on the campus at New River. So you'll see a difference in the way things look, but it's still the same procedure. Okay. So those, so we have 11 of them to be completed, right? And the schedule tells you when to do them, when they're due. There's extra graph paper. Sometimes you have to do some graphing like um, Boyle's Law. There's some graph paper built in, but if you mess up and you need some more graph paper, then here you can print some more graph paper. Okay, uh, what else did I miss? Safety data sheets. Um, you can look at these. They tell you what things to be aware of in the, in the lab. And in, in the lab space itself, I have a, these printed out in hard copy in a red or maybe it's a blue uh, loose leaf binder on the side of the lab on the bench where you can look them up. And they're also, all of them are here. So these are the materials that you would be working with in the lab and their safety data sheets are incorporated. Has everybody, have you ever looked at a safety data sheet? Most of it is, is mandated by law and the really the meat of the stuff can be said in two or three sentences. But, but there they are for you to look at if you want. Okay, any questions? We need to hop on. I think in 45 minutes I should be able to get to finish the, uh, the first chapter. Okay, let me pull that out. Here we go. There's my, my PowerPoints. It's, it's fairly thin, so if, I'm, if I watch myself, then we should be good to go. Okay, let's see. Everything is on screen and in focus. Okay. So now we're going to, uh, uh, you can print the PowerPoints out if you want. Usually what I do is if we're face to face, um, I usually have printed copies and I hand them out in class. So you can scribble on them if you want. But since this is recorded, and you can do that later if you want. Okay, so I'm, let me share the PowerPoints. And if I can find them. Uh, show all windows. Okay, here we go. There's my PowerPoints. There we go. Okay, so now I need to turn that into a slideshow. Slideshow, please. There we go. Okay, so... I hope everybody sees chapter one, basic concepts about matter. Uh, this is a general outline. And this, this might be, I think these, uh, the, the color scheme in the background, this is what your text should look like. For, I think we're still using seventh edition. But I'm not going to change the slides, even if we go to an eighth or ninth edition, <clears throat> because I modify the slides and I don't want to have to go in to a whole new set of slides and modify all of them again. I guess I could uh, copy and paste the PowerPoints into the into the new slides and use their uh, their background format. That would work. But that's neither here nor there. So these are the topics we're going to cover today, hopefully, uh, in the time we have remaining. If not, when we run out of time, you're free to go, and I'll just keep talking until I'm finished. Okay, so what is chemistry? Chemistry is a really, really broad area, and it sort of came together in pieces. Um, but a short version of the description of what chemistry is, um, it's the study of substances, right? <laughs> how general can you get? Substances and how they change 
from one substance into another. The transformation is key to chemistry. We want to know how things change. Um, so that, and that leaves it wide open to so many possibilities. Unlike physics, like physics is fairly narrowly defined. It, a physicist might argue with me on that, but uh, physics is definitely more narrowly defined than chemistry is. Uh, besides, um, a physicist would say chemistry is just applied physics. Okay, so when we talk about matter, uh, I can remember way back in grade school, uh, matter was defined as uh, anything that, that has mass and occupies space. Right? That's a pretty good definition. Mass refers to how much of it is there. And the key to mass is it doesn't matter where you are in the universe. Well, unless extreme conditions, but typically <laughs> for our purposes, uh, mass is a constant. If I, if my mass is, uh, I don't know, um, 90 kilograms, then I'm going to be 90 kilograms no matter where I am, right? That doesn't change. Mass does not change. Weight changes. Weight is a measure of force. Mass is a measure of substance. So if I'm on earth, I'll weigh uh, 210 pounds. If I'm on the moon, I'll weigh, let me see if I can do that in my head, maybe 35 pounds. Okay, so there's a difference between mass and weight. We use the values of mass and weight interchangeably, unfortunately. <clears throat> but we'll, more about that later. Um, anything in nature whether it's uh, living, non-living, um, natural, synthetic, uh, can be included in that umbrella of matter. Now, energy is something different. Energy is not matter. Right? Energy uh, is a special case, and we can, rather than define it, we can say, uh, this are, these are examples of energy. Heat, right? We have an intuitive feel for what heat is. Light, uh, electricity, you know. I've come too close to contacts in the electric socket and found out what electricity was. I've also found out that the electricity that shocked me in that, in that wall socket was alternating current versus direct current. You can tell by the way it's fluctuates. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, energy is not matter. But the whole universe can be summed up if we can describe the matter that's in the universe and the energy. That covers everything. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip these little short answer things. For our purposes, we're going to classify the physical states of matter uh, in only three states. There are others, but for our purposes, and for most chemistry, solids, liquids, gases, that covers everything for us. And we have an intuition about what they mean. We, we kind of know what a solid should be, or what a liquid should be, or what a gas should be. But for scientists, that's not good enough. We've got to be more uh, accurate in our description, right? So a solid is characterized by a definite shape. In other words, it holds its own shape. It doesn't need a container. And it has a definite volume. As long as we don't change the temperature or change the physical surroundings in any way, it has a definite volume and a definite shape, uh, like a uh, how about a, a brick of gold? <laughs> that would be a nice shape to have, a nice uh, definite volume to have, particularly at today's prices. Liquids, on the other hand, 
have a definite volume, but they don't have a definite shape. They assume the shape of the container. Now, while we're discussing these differences in uh, ah, mine's gone blank, brain freeze. Um, the differences in uh, states, we ought to be thinking, why are they different? All right, there's your friend again, curiosity. Why are these uh, physical states different? There's a reason for it, and we can explain that. But for now, we're just defining them. Gases, on the other hand, uh, have no shape and have no volume of their own. The gas will assume the shape of the container. It will also assume the volume. If there's a vacuum outside of your container, say in the a larger container outside the inner container, and you are able to open the valve of the inner container, the gas will escape. It will blow out into that vacuum and it will equalize pressure everywhere to fill that space. Okay, these are just examples. Um, that looks like Dwight Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, in a, a Liberty Half Dollar, I think it looks like. 1974. I think that's after they started um, debasing the currency, right? Used to be 90% silver. Then they started mixing in copper. And later on, they didn't even go to that trouble. They, if you look at the edge of a coin, sometimes you'll see one color on this side and one color on that side. They use cladding technology. They just smash them together. They don't even bother to make an alloy. So well, that's what civilizations do. Eventually they debase the currency. The governments debase the currency so they can get more use out of the money without having to go to the taxpayers. This is a liquid. I'm not sure what that is, a green color. Um, this is a gas and it has a lid on it, see? That's probably chlorine, more than likely. Okay, so what does the state of matter depend on? It depends on temperature, right? We know if we heat ice, it'll melt, change from solid to liquid. If we keep heating it, add enough energy, it'll change from liquid water to steam. Right? So temperature is important. Surrounding pressure is important too. Um, if you put, um, I don't know if you've ever done this before in, in science class, uh, say in high school or grade school even, if you put a, a beaker of water in a bell jar and the bell jar is attached to a vacuum pump, you can set that beaker of water in there, put the bell jar over it, turn on the vacuum pump, and that means the pressure is dropping. And pretty soon, you'll start seeing the water boil. Well, we didn't, we didn't heat it up to 100 degrees centigrade or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. We decreased the pressure. So we changed it from a liquid to a gas simply by changing the pressure of the surroundings. And then the other consideration that this is really going to the meat of chemistry. We're changing one substance into another and it's based upon what are the strengths of the forces holding the individual particles together. So for a substance like, um, oh, ether, right? Everybody knows what ether smells like, I guess. Um, the forces holding the ether molecules together are very weak. So at room temperature, if you open a container of ether, pretty soon you're going to smell it across the room really quickly. Whereas if you have a beaker of um, ethanol, you know, the drinking kind of alcohol, then um, it will take a lot longer 
before you smell it over there. And you may never smell it on the other side of the room. You may have to get right down on it. The forces holding the ethanol molecules together are much stronger, right? So they don't change from liquid to gas as quickly as ether does. And that's purely due to the strength of those intermolecular forces, we call them. Okay. So what's a property? It's a property is a, is a characteristic of some substance um, that is helpful in identifying what it is, right? So, and we can subdivide those properties, which are unique for each substance. We can subdivide them into either physical properties or chemical properties. So what do we mean by that? Well, physical property is something that you can observe usually and um, the characteristic that you observe does not change the identity of the substance. So the color, of course, when you see the color, that's not going to have an effect. Odor, no. Physical state, no, no change there, but it's still a property, right? It helps us describe the material, the matter. Melting point is a property. Now, how do we know that? Because when you melt something, you don't change it from one uh, compound or element into another. In other words, the melting point of ice is zero degrees centigrade. But if you melt it and then you cool it back down and refreeze it, you get ice again. So you go back and forth, ice, liquid water, ice, liquid water, water, liquid ice. It's still water. So the melting point is a physical property. Same with boiling point, uh, hardness, right? What's the hardest natural, uh, naturally occurring substance on earth? Girl's best friend, diamond. Diamond. Yeah. Um, now we can make diamond, right? We can make industrial diamonds. Actually, we're pretty good now at making gem quality diamonds. So that ought to bring the price down on uh, naturally occurring diamonds. <clears throat> anyway, these are physical properties. They are descriptors for the substance in which the, the nature, the identity of the substance does not change. Um, okay, chemical properties. Okay, these are characteristics that describe a way a substance can undergo change or how it resists change to make a new substance. Right. So we're talking about actually changing the substance and what is the property that allows that substance to do that. So when we say a copper object turns green when exposed to the air, that has changed copper from something else entirely different. And you can see that on any building that has a copper roof. If it has uh, copper shingles or copper sheet, initially it starts off nice, that pretty uh, copper color. <laughs> the kind of, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, uh, reddish orange color is copper. But over time, it develops that uh, sort of greenish bluish tinge to it. That's called its patina. And it's a desirable characteristic, but it's not copper anymore. Um, analyses have been done and it turns out that there are different compounds like copper sulfide is one of them, uh, copper sulfate, uh, even um, uh, copper oxide is formed. And all of those give it that patina, but they're not copper anymore. That characteristic that's described in this statement is a chemical property. Okay. Uh, I'm running short of time. I'm going to have to move along. Sorry. There's that patina that's on the uh, Statue of Liberty. And not too long ago, uh, the Statue of Liberty was uh, 
repaired. So they reclad it. Uh, I, actually, I think they might have tried to use some of the old copper cladding. They just repaired the infra, the uh, superstructure. So it should still be that color. Um, all right, so let's let's do this one. Uh, identify one of these as a physical or a chemical property. Iron metal rusts in an atmosphere of moist air. Right? Is rust iron? No, it's different. It's a different substance. That's a chemical property. There used to be a building in Atlanta <clears throat> called the Omni. And some architect got the really bright idea that, hey, wait a minute, if we make this building, uh, clad this building on the outside with a special form of, of steel that is formulated to rust really fast, it'll form a coating of rust on the outside and stop it from deteriorating further, right? It forms a skin. Well, this, they built the building, <laughs> but what they didn't realize was that when iron rusts, when steel rusts, it expands in volume. The rust is, occupies more volume. So it doesn't cling very well to the surface. It, it kind of, it, it exfoliate is the word. So the next strong rain, and Atlanta has a lot of those rainstorms. It washed that iron, that rust off onto the concrete around the building and created an ugly mess. <laughs> Eventually they tore the building down, but that's a chemical property, iron metal rust. How about mercury metal is a liquid at room temperature? That's a physical property. It hasn't changed in anything. We're not describing a change. Mercury metal is just a liquid at room temperature. <clears throat> Nickel metal dissolves in acid to produce a light green solution. That should be a chemical property. How do we know? Because the, the color tells us that something has changed. The nickel metal has a certain appearance. I mean, if it's a nice uh, strip or a brick of metal and it's, it's fresh, it's had a clean surface, it's going to have that luster, the metallic luster. When you dissolve it in water, in this acid, it, it's changing. The nickel is going into solution and it's combining with water molecules to change its structure, okay? In addition to whatever is in the acid, it reacts with that. So that's a chemical property. Now, what's the difference between a property and a change? A change describes the process that occurs. So if we have a physical change, we describe it as say, for instance, what is it that leads to the formation of the new substance? Or what is it that leads to um, not necessarily a new substance, but a new state of the substance? Because if it's a physical change, the substance hasn't changed its identity. So boiling or freezing water is the description of a physical change rather than the boiling point, which is a physical property. Okay, chemical change, similar. It describes the process of the change from one substance into another with a different identity. So when we say the rusting of iron objects left exposed to moisture of air, we're describing a chemical change. Not the ability to rust, but the actual rusting is a description of the change. I know that's a fine distinction, but it's an important one. And this is like a decision chart, um, a flow chart that can help you organize the information. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on that. I think it came straight out of your book actually. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna have to move along here. When we describe substances, we uh, either describe them as one of the subdivisions of the substance characterization is whether it's a pure substance or a mixture. 
So what do we mean by pure substance? Well, if we have a pure substance in our possession, it's a single kind of matter. In other words, um, uh, the only way to change it into something else is by chemical means. And if you use physical means to separate everything in the substance, and you keep say, chop it in half, divide it, divide it, divide it, divide it, you got the same substance no matter how the small amount is, right down to the molecule or the element. So physical means are used to purify a substance and to determine whether it's pure or not. If it's not pure, and you can separate substances, two or more different substances, we call that a mixture. So two or more pure substances together forms a mixture. Um, pure water, pure sucrose, table sugar, those are pure substances. Um, or a brick of gold, that's a pure substance of gold. Uh, but it's an element not a compound. The mixture then can be divided by physical means. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, let's see if you have salt and water together in a solution. And I just used a word I haven't defined yet, so I apologize. They're a mixture. The salt still has its identity and the water still has its identity. How do we separate them? Well, you could boil it, distill the water off, catch it, condense it. You got water here and you got salt here. In fact, one of the labs we do uses that process to separate salt and water. Um, so the physical means separates mixtures. Now, one, if you have a mixture, you can subdivide the mixture into two different types. If it's a homogeneous mixture, then no matter where you look in whatever size sample you take of a homogeneous mixture, the composition is always the same. This substance ratioed to that substance, ratioed to that substance, they're always the same. Like if it's one to one to one, no matter what the size of the, the sample, it's always going to be one to one to one. That's homogeneous. If it's heterogeneous, then if you take a sample from here and a sample from here, they will have different compositions. Okay, that's heterogeneous. There's another name for homogeneous mixtures. We call them solutions. And solutions don't necessarily have to be solids dissolved in liquids. All you need is a homogeneous mixture. That could be two gases. Right? And interesting thing about gases is if you put two gases together or more than two gases together, they always form a solution every time. They're homogeneous. Why? Because the distance between the particles, there's plenty of room for everybody. So they just move out, share the space evenly. Okay, so here's a, another decision chart to our uh, schematic. So matter could either be a pure substance or a mixture, and the mixture can either be a homogeneous or a heterogeneous mixture. There you go. So which one of these is homogeneous mixture? Okay, here's problem solving technique. Look at the question and read it backwards. Which one of these is a mixture? Pure water is not a mixture. Uh, copper metal is not a mixture. So those are out right at the beginning. A and E cannot be homogeneous because it's not a mixture. So now all we have to do is decide among B, C, and D. So what do we have? Well, we look, let's look at the middle one, jelly beans. Anybody that's looked at a jar of jelly beans knows it's not homogeneous. You'll have concentrations of different colors here and there. Soil. Soil is a heterogeneous mixture. Take my word for it. I have a PhD in soil science. Soil is a heterogeneous mixture. So gasoline is 
homogeneous. It's predominantly octane, which is a hydrocarbon distilled from oil. And then companies usually put other stuff in it. They put volatile compounds in it in the summer and not so much uh, in the winter, excuse me. And they pull some of those volatile compounds out in the summer. And then they put additives in there that they claim keep your engine clean and your carburetors running smoothly and your injectors working okay. So gasoline is a mixture, a homogeneous mixture. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, and we're about to run out of it, I think. Oh, we're good till 11 o'clock. So we got 19 minutes left. <clears throat> What's the difference between an element and a compound? Well, first place, element is a pure substance. It can't be broken down by physical means. It can't even be broken down by chemical means. And if you continue to, if you think you have an element and you continue to subdivide it by physical means, then eventually you get down to one unit of the element. That's the atom. Before people understood what atoms were, they still had identified elements because they couldn't purify them any further. And they identified them. And we have many of those that were just sitting there waiting for us when modern chemistry arrived and was able to take those historical elements and put them in the periodic table. And then once we found that, uh, where they went in the periodic table, then we were able to start looking for other elements. Right? So a lot of the elements we discovered in, uh, in modern times uh, were actually sought actively looked for and later on created artificially but these elements <clears throat> cannot be broken down into more than one pure substance by either physical or chemical means so examples gold silver and copper right metals <clears throat> very useful metals Okay, compounds. Compounds are a combination of, well, a compound itself is a pure substance, but it's, it can be broken down into two or more simpler pure substances by chemical means. Uh, example is the water. Right? So we can take water, and this won't mean anything right now, but it will later. We can take H2O, which has two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. And we can run electricity through it just the right way. And we would end up with hydrogen and oxygen. Now, that's not a balanced equation. We'll talk about balancing equations later. But you have this pure substance that makes two or more simpler pure substances. That's a compound. <clears throat> now, we don't want to get compounds and mixtures confused. Mixtures can be separated by physical means. Compounds cannot be broken down by physical means. Chemical means only. There's, you have to break bonds that are holding atoms together. That's what we mean by chemical means. Um, compounds do have a definite chemical composition. And we could take those same elements, hydrogen and oxygen, put them together in different ratios and different configurations and make a completely different chemical compound. Right? Hydrogen peroxide is a perfect example. Hydrogen peroxide is not water, but it's composed of hydrogen and oxygen, just like water is. But they're arranged differently, and they have different composition. 
Uh, okay. Oh, another characteristic of compounds is they always have the same mass ratios of element to element. Right? So for water, it's 11.2% hydrogen, 88.8% oxygen by mass. Whereas hydrogen peroxide would be a different composition. The hydrogen composition would be higher and the oxygen composition would be lower. But no matter where the water comes from, no matter how it's produced, it always has 11.2% hydrogen, 88.8% oxygen. Whereas mixtures uh, can change. If you have something, uh, one substance mixed with another one, uh, it just depends on how much you put together as to what the composition is. And if it's heterogeneous, that composition can be all over the map. Here's another decision chart, but I'm not going to spend time on that. Because I want to get this finished. Uh, we might be close. Are we close? Let me see, section 1-6. We'll look at my hard copy. Yeah, almost. Looks like I'm going to go over anyway. <clears throat> um, so when you're classifying matter, what are some questions that you can ask to decide where it fits? And I will say this, <clears throat> um, the natural world just is, it does what it does, right? Uh, if we weren't here to study it, it would still go on doing what it does. So science and chemistry in particular uh, develops uh, explanations for things that happen in nature. Nature could care less what our explanations were. We just do it that way so that we can make sense of the world. Right? And this is one of those things. We ask questions. Does the sample of matter have the same properties throughout? Right? If it has the same properties all the way through, then uh, it's either a pure substance or it's a, a homogeneous mixture. Are two or more substances present? Ah, then we differentiate between pure substance and homogeneous mixture. So if we have two substances that we can separate by physical means, then we know it's a mixture. If we can't separate them by physical means, and it, we have identified it as a pure substance, can the pure substance be broken down into simpler substances by chemical means? So these are things that you can do and that chemists do all the time in the laboratory to characterize substances. So what's the difference between an element and a compound? Well, I'm just going to tell you. An element can't be broken down into simpler substances by chemical means. There's no way. The only way you can break an element into simpler substances is by nuclear means, right? You put it in a nuclear reactor where there's a, a high flux of neutrons that are bombarding your element, and you can actually change it into some a different element by doing that. Okay, how many elements are there? Well, actually, there are 118 elements. So you should find 118 little squares in your periodic table, and each one has a symbol in it. Now, not too long ago, uh, some of those positions were, uh, had placeholders in them because the substance hadn't been, the element had not been characterized or named, right? So they used a convention for naming them and I'm not gonna go into that because it's, actually it's kind of stupid. <clears throat> but now they all have names. Every one of them, all 118 has a name, um, roughly. 88 of those elements can be found in nature. And 30 of them uh, have been synthesized. Uh, now there's one caveat to that. These elements that were synthesized originally, some of them have had 
been identified in nature. They were the, in nature, they were in such small amounts that we couldn't isolate them. We couldn't find them with our, with as techniques improved over the years. Now we can identify them from nature, but they were first synthesized. And that's typically how they're reported in the periodic table. Um, and most of those are radioactive anyway. So they're here today and gone tomorrow. <laughs> okay, so what's the abundance of these elements in, uh, in the universe to begin with, right? Now, it depends on uh, your unit of measure. How are we describing the abundance, right? So we need to identify that atom percent. So atom for atom, um, so say we have, we get a hundred atoms gathered from the universe, then 91 of them on average will be hydrogen. Okay. Nine of them will be helium and the rest will be, uh, one, uh, less than 0.1%. So this is a rounding error, right? 91 plus nine is hundred percent. So where'd you get the other less than 0.1%? <laughs> That's a rounding error, <clears throat> but roughly 91% of the atoms in the, in the universe are hydrogen, which is probably good because that means the universe has plenty of fuel to, to keep going, right? Because what fuels a star? Hydrogen. That's how it starts compress hydrogen to high temperatures and pressures, and you start getting nuclear reactions, fusions. Okay, atom percent, we're still talking number of atoms, abundance of elements in the Earth's crust. Now we're getting, we're talking about a rocky planet. We're not talking about the whole universe anymore. 60 of those 100 atoms in the Earth's crust, now it's just in the crust, we're not going down into the mantle or the core of the earth, just in the crust. Uh, 60 of those atoms will be oxygen. So what that tells me is that most of the elements in the earth's crust are combined in some way with oxygen. Now, if you include the oceans as part of the, the surface, right? That makes sense because oxygen is 88% of water but a lot of elements especially what those that are industrially significant are combined with oxygen like iron oxide which is the main component of iron ore right if we want to get iron out of iron ore we have to remove the oxygen and then we want to convert iron into steel so that it takes a little more work but the iron itself is only 2.2% of the Earth's crust. So when we want to mine these elements, we have to find concentrations of them. These are average values. Uh, the next most abundant is silicon. Right now, where do you find silicon? Well, definitely in, in soils, right? I've studied silicon for several years. Um, so it's in soils, but where do soils come from? Soils are created by weathering of rock, right? So silicon is present in the rock. It's present in broken down rock, like sand on the beach, it is primarily silicon dioxide. Aluminum is fairly abundant also. Uh, aluminosilicates constitute the majority of soils. And there are these other elements. Okay, so most is oxygen, next is silicon, next is aluminum. And hydrogen is in there too, but it's not as common in the crust. Okay, most abundant oxygen, silicon in the universe, hydrogen. All right, symbols for elements. The symbols for the elements were devised were proposed back in the 
early 18th century or late 17th century. Different schemes for element symbols were proposed and some were really crazy. I'm glad the one that came through was the choice, choice one. It was proposed by a chemist named Berzelius. He was a Swedish guy, I believe. And he said, why make this complicated? Just take the, the, uh, the Latin alphabet, you know, A through Z, and use those letters. So some of the elements will only have one letter. They're always capitalized. Hydrogen, there you go. Um, uh, oxygen, O, there you go. What if you want to name something where the single letter is already taken? Well, you can move to two letters then. And when you do that, the first one is always capitalized and the second one is always small. So if you answer a question and you say, and you need to identify barium, and you say capital B, capital A, you're wrong. It's always capital small. All right, just a word of warning. So um, many of the elements can be associated with the English words as the first two letters. Like helium is H-E, large H, small E. But some of the elements have names that bear no resemblance to their English words, like silver, right? How do you get A-G from S-I-L-V-E-R? The trick is Latin. The Latin word for silver is argentum. So A-G was used for silver. Why not AR? AR was already taken. AR is argon. So we had to go to AG for silver. Gold is AU. Latin is aurum. Iron is FE for ferrum. Lead is PB for plumbum. By the way, plumbum in Latin means heavy. <laughs> okay, so that one makes sense. Uh, copper is close but CU stands for cuprum. There are several of the elements that are like this. There's one called wolfram, W. That stands for the element tungsten. Okay, so you'll find these amongst those that I want you to memorize. And you just have to uh, drill them until you know them. That's all there is to it. At the beginning of this course, there's a lot of memory work, right? Less memory work as we go. Once you get this vocabulary in mind uh, and some other things that you have to memorize along the way, um, then most of it is, is reasoning and problem solving techniques. Okay, uh, let's see. How about atoms and molecules? I got one minute left and I'm almost out of time, so I'm just gonna keep talking. And uh, I've seen some people have already left, that's fine. Um, you're not hurting my feelings any, I just keep going. Um, the atom, like I alluded to earlier, is the smallest particle of an element that still retains the identity of the element. Okay, very small atom. And for the longest time, Scientists believe that the atom was as small as you could get. You can't get any smaller. And that the structure of the atom, if it had one internally was uniform throughout. It was just like a, a bag of jelly. Um, but the, the atom is extremely small. <clears throat> In fact, it's only recently that we've been able to image atoms uh, with our technology. For the longest time, not even a microscope, the, the best light microscopes in the world could see an atom. And that's just a limitation of the technology itself because light can only see things of a certain size. And if the size of the particle is smaller than the wavelength of the light, you're not gonna see it. Okay, so um, atom is the smallest one you can have. So what's a molecule then? A molecule is a group of two or more atoms that function as a single unit. 
they are tightly bound together, right? Now, these molecules can be composed of two or more of the same atom, that's kosher, like the diatomic molecules um, of the uh, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Those are diatomic molecules of the uh, atom. Some form triatomics or, or form eight together. So um, those are molecules. Now, other molecules like water. Water functions as a single unit because the oxygen and the hydrogen atoms are bound together so tightly that they behave as a single unit. Those are molecules. Homoatomic molecules are those where there's only one type of element involved. So the Cl2, the chlorine molecule, is homoatomic. It has two chlorine atoms. The phosphorus molecule has four phosphorus atoms. The sulfur molecule has eight sulfur atoms bound together, and they behave as a single unit. Those are homoatomic. Heteroatomic is like water, two different types of atoms or more. So we've got hydrogen, we've got oxygen. Um, uh, the glucose that circulates in your blood that delivers energy from the food to your cells, that's a heteroatomic molecule composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. You have six carbon atoms, 12 hydrogen atoms, six oxygen atoms combined together. Examples of heteroatomic molecules. <clears throat> so what kind is this? Classify, what is Xe? That's xenon. It's a noble gas. Xenon tetrafluoride. Tetra means four. So four fluorine atoms and one xenon atom. So is that, uh, what is that? Diatomic, triatomic? It's diatomic. There are two types of atoms there. Oh, wait a minute, excuse me. The number of atoms, pardon me, pentatomic, it has five atoms in it. Five atoms means pentatomic. Is it homo or heteroatomic? Well, it's hetero, that's two types of elements. Is it an element or a compound? Well, obviously it's a compound because they're, they're, a compound requires that you combine uh, two different types of elements together or more. So uh, Cl2, chlorine, is not a compound. It's a molecule, yes, but a compound requires, well, for lack, for fear of being redundant, compounding two or more elements together. Okay. So how do we write these things? Well, um, this may come later, but I think it's important to describe now. When we write the symbol for an element, and I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use X for my element symbol because there's no element on the periodic table that is an X. So I'll use it as a substitute for any symbol. There are four corners, four positions on that element. Here, 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 and here. Down here tells you how many of them are there. Okay? So a subscript on this side says there are two X's if there's two, or three X's if it's three, or four if it's four. Okay? And that's important for writing compounds because in H2O, we have two hydrogen atoms combined with one oxygen. Okay? Um, the other places. This is the position for a charge. So if, if our element, or actually a combination of atoms, has a charge, we put it up there in the upper right-hand corner. 
we say uh, one minus, two minus, three minus, one plus, two plus, three plus, or if there's nothing there, there's no charge. Now, these two positions are, uh, are reserved for describing a particular atom in terms of its atomic number. That's the number of protons. We'll talk about this a little bit more later, but I just want to get this out of the way. And up here is its mass number. Uh, let's see, A. That's the mass number. You don't have to know what that is right now. I'll tell you later. But for our purposes in this discussion, that one's important. You know, how many of them are there? So notice that when we get to into very complicated arrangements of atoms, sometimes we have to use parentheses. So what does the parentheses mean? It means that any subscript down here, this two, has to propagate through the entire contents of the parentheses to tell you how many atoms there actually are. So this grouping has one phosphorus and four oxygens, but we need two groupings. This is a polyatomic ion. I'll describe that later. So we have two times the one phosphorus means we actually have two phosphorus atoms in that group. I mean that in that compound. And we actually have eight oxygen atoms in that compound. Over here, we just have three calciums. Okay. So if you're counting them up, three calciums, two phosphorus, eight oxygens, that's how we got those values. So, uh, how many atoms of each here? Well, this one has two hydrogens, one sulfur, and four oxygens. That's easy. This one has two irons, three carbons, and nine oxygens. Okay? Uh, so, when you write a chemical formula, it has the symbols for the elements and some subscript to tell you how many there are. Actually, I think we're, when I see a concept question like this, we're toward the end. Yeah, okay, so we can take a little time here. So let's say an electrical current is applied to 50 milliliters of water, and after a period of time, there's nothing left in the container. Why is that? Well, more than likely, uh, well, there are two possibilities, right? It could be a physical change or a chemical change. Electric current, you know, when you run electric current through a resistor, you get heat. So we could get heat in the water. And what could possibly happen is there's enough heat to boil the water off. But if that electricity is used to break bonds, we could have a chemical change, in which case uh, what I showed you earlier would happen. The water would be broken down into hydrogen and oxygen. So what we're saying here is more likely is a chemical change occurred. But you could conceivably have, have evaporated some of the water. Okay, you're given two cylinders, each contains a gas, and you're requested to test the flammability of each gas. And you find that one gas is very flammable, the other extinguishes the flame. All right, so how would you test that? Right, use an open flame? Eh, probably wouldn't be the best idea. You need something that will, will test flammability without being too flammable itself. So what we usually use is a glowing splint. It's just a strip of wood that's been treated so that it will glow, but it won't burn. And it will ignite um, gases as a test. So if we take that water and I've done this before. <clears throat> I used to have an apparatus in one of the chemistry uh, courses I taught 
used to have an apparatus that would um, hydrolyze water, split it into oxygen and hydrogen, and separate them into two paths. So if we did this and make that and that, and that little G in parentheses means gas, right? and separate them, then if we put that glowing splint into this thing, it would cause the splint to erupt in flames because oxygen has that effect. If we stuck it into that one, then the splint would not burn, but the mixture of oxygen that's at the surface and propagated throughout would cause this to burn and revert to that. So it would pop usually, just pop. But if we didn't have those two gases in there, we had something that would extinguish the glowing splint. That's what we're looking at here. One of them is flammable and one of them's not. The two gases are what? Well, if one extinguishes the flame and one burns, if we say hydrogen and methane, both of those are flammable gases, so that can't be it. If we say hydrogen and oxygen, that can't be it either because one of them is flammable and one of them supports burning, but it's not flammable itself, right? We can tell that from the splint. The gas doesn't burn, the splint burns. So D can't be working either. Neon is a noble gas. It will never burn. <laughs> Hydrogen burns and carbon dioxide extinguishes flames. That's the key right there. The rest of it, test taking technique, we've identified the answer there simply by the filling in the first two blanks. So the other information should fall into place. Um, classified as one, a diatomic molecule. Yes, hydrogen is diatomic and carbon dioxide is heteroatomic molecule. That's true also. Um, you ever used a carbon dioxide fire extinguisher? We don't find them. They're not too common. Some places still use them. And in order, and what you'll see is it's got the cylinder, but it's got the nozzle that swivels and the nozzle has this big old horn on it. That's because the contents of the cylinder are liquid actually. And when you, with some gas pressure, and when you open the valve, the liquid is sprayed out into that nozzle, but you don't want it to be liquid when it hits the flame. You want it to be gas so that it will penetrate the flame and smother it. Okay. Oh, that's it. We're done and I'll stop the share. And I appreciate those of you who are able to stick around. We went 15 minutes over. So next Friday, um, we'll look at uh, chapter two and you can start memorizing your elements and working some of the uh, homework problems for chapter one. And let's see, did I, I haven't watched recently to see if I missed anybody. So I, I don't see them still here if they ever were here. Okay. So unless you have some, some other questions, we're done for today. Have a good weekend. Have a good week.